During the time when everyone was financially devastated by the First World War, from 1914 to 1918, a man by the name of Charles Ponzi had brought a shed of hope to the darkest of times. In the eyes of the people, he was an outstanding investor, a financier who brought profits upon profits to people who were willing to give him their money. As more people knew of his existence, they were lining up holding their life savings with the hope of getting richer, begging Charles Ponzi to take their money. But little do they know, Charles Ponzi's genius financial scheme that helped many investors to become richer was built on top of a sea of lies. Destroying at least 15,000 people's life savings and bringing down five other banks as the house of cards tumbled down, this is the story of Charles Ponzi, the fool that tricked the whole world. Even a hundred years later, his name still reigns in our modern society as the Ponzi scheme. You are now watching the White Obsidian Channel. Charles Ponzi was born at the northern part of Italy on the 3rd of March, 1882. His father, Oresti Ponzi, is a hard-working postman and his mother was a loving housewife. Overall, his family was financially comfortable. After his father's death, he inherited a modest sum of a fortune and was sent to a prestigious college in Italy by his mother, with the hope of seeing his son becoming successful through higher education. But Charles Ponzi had other plans. Instead of attending classes, he decided to burn through all the leftover fortune by covering himself with the latest fashions and eating at the fanciest restaurants. Occasionally, he would gamble at casinos with his rich friends while pretending he had an endless amount of money to be spent. Until one fateful day, the consequences of his spending habits came crashing down as the before-mentioned inheritance money finally ran out. With no chance of graduating due to his lack of attention to his studies, he had no choice but to work. Even with his caring and generous uncle offering him a job position as a clerk, he felt repulsive about having a 9-to-5 job, mainly because of his wealth-driven, egoistic mindset. He felt like he had only one choice left which is go to America and strike it rich there. After arriving in Boston in 1903, he made a promise that he would redeem himself by returning to Italy as a rich man after a few years, instead of letting his mother down again. Ponzi spent the next few years up and down the East Coast, from New York to Florida. Throughout those years, he worked as a waiter, sign painter, clerk for a grocery store, a dishwasher, factory worker, an insurance salesman, and a sewing machine repairman. And none of them lasted long. Ponzi either quit because he hated the work, or he was fired because he tried to cheat his customers. When he manages to get some income with all the labor work, he would just blow it all away on a weekend vacation or a fancy meal to remind himself of the good old days. After a few years on the streets, his perspective of working had changed for the better because when he had arrived at Montreal, Canada in 1907, he found a decent job as a clerk at a bank called Banco Zerossi that mainly served Italian immigrants. Unfortunately for Ponzi, his new job at the bank didn't last long either, as his boss was a con man. Zerossi, the boss, was using money from his newest clients to pay off his older ones. Because of this leverage, Zerossi was able to offer up to 6% interest rate which is double the average amount on all deposits by his clients. As time passed, his clients started getting suspicious when their relatives back home kept complaining about not receiving the money the bank was supposed to send. Just one year after Ponzi had gotten his job, the authorities began investigating the bank for embezzlement. Zerossi wasted no time, filled a suitcase with cash and fled to Mexico leaving his employees and family to deal with the fallout from his scam. Not wanting to take the fall, Ponzi had decided to move back to the States while trying to forge a check from one of his bank's clients. As soon as Ponzi tried to cash out the fraudulent check, the bank teller easily spotted the fake signature and quickly alerted the police. Just like that, Ponzi spent three years in a prison in Quebec. 
After just two years, however, he was released on parole and immediately made his way to the States after being approached for a smuggling job. While heading there, he took five Italian immigrants with him, all fresh off the boat without any proper papers, as he had been paid to get the job done. Instead of getting a quick buck after being a free man again, he got caught and was arrested once again. During his time in prison, he had thought of all kinds of ways to become rich, but all of them required a substantial amount of capital, and he was penniless. After two years, he was released from jail at a prison in Atlanta and began wandering from state to state again, working whatever odd jobs that came his way. He finally settled at a decent job as a clerk for an import-export business at a company called J.R. Poole in Boston, back to the same place where he first stepped on American soil. For the second time around, life in Boston was better for Ponzi. He was good at his job and was even promoted for it. Not long after, he met 21-year-old Rose Necco and fell in love with her. Fortunately for him, the feeling was mutual and they were happily married in 1918. Although life has seemed to be settled for Ponzi and his beloved wife was content with the simple life, Ponzi had greater ambitions. Knowing that the salary of a clerk would never reach that dream, he decided to quit his job and started off joining his father-in-law's wholesale fruit selling business. However, the business was not sustainable and went bankrupt by the end of the year. Without giving up, Ponzi quickly made his next move, which was renting a small office to start his own import and export business. With the lack of experience and capital to advertise his service, Ponzi's import and export business became another failed venture. Same goes for the next company that he started called Trader's Guide, which involves issuing trade magazines and charging companies a certain fee if they want to advertise on it. When Ponzi approached the bank for loans, since his money had run out, his application was rejected on the spot as the president of the bank had given Ponzi a harsh reality check where he would never loan him a single dollar ever again. With little choice left, he fired his staff and sublet his office space to earn some money. One fateful day in August of 1919, Ponzi was going through his mail and came across a letter from Spain when he had thought no one was interested in paying the advertisement fee for his Trader's Guide magazine. The Spanish author of the letter requested a copy of the magazine and offered to pay for the postage. He included something that Ponzi had never seen before, an International Reply Coupon or IRC. IRCs were prepaid coupons that are commonly used by people who send letters internationally to cover the costs of a return letter in any country that was a member of the Universal Postal Union. And this was a bolt of inspiration for Ponzi and was about to change his life forever. So in January of 1920, Ponzi started another new company called Securities Exchange Company. Unfortunately for Ponzi, his hopes and dreams for this new company were to no avail. His original plan was buying IRC in Italy, where the nation's currency, Lira, had taken a serious hit after World War I, and then redeem it in the States to sell those stamps in a currency-stronger nation for a tiny profit. The truth was that the arbitrage of IRCs was so small and would just get wiped out by the cost of shipping them from one country to another. But Ponzi refused to let go of this idea, further convincing himself this was the one-way ticket to the life of wealth and luxury that he always felt he deserved. So when a failed but legitimate business proved unsustainable, he turned the business idea into the infamous Ponzi scheme that shares his name. Taking inspiration from his recent desk job as a clerk at Banco Zerosi, his new idea involves convincing people to invest in a business opportunity by promising them huge returns. But in reality, Ponzi would keep most of the money to himself while giving some of the profits to earlier investors using the money given by new investors. It is a very simple but effective system that preys on people's greed and financial naivety but it requires a constant flow of new funds in order to keep the scam going. Even though the scheme was named after Ponzi, he was not the first one to do it. If you're interested to know who were the first few people to have implemented financial frauds similar to Ponzi, you can check the reference links in the description for more information. 
Using his system, Ponzi offered investors a staggering 50% return in 45 days, or 100% return in 90 days. He convinced people by claiming that he has a vast network of agents around the world buying IRCs in bulk and shipping them to America. When asked about the details of his operation, Ponzi would refuse to disclose any further information. Ponzi started out with the people in his own neighborhood, with 18 of them willing to invest in the first month. Once they were all paid for their first round of profits, word spread and soon thousands of people began begging Ponzi to take their money while crowding outside of his office. Month after month, Ponzi was raking in over $250,000 a day at the peak of his operation. The Boston Post hailed him as a financial genius, which gave him yet more perceived credibility and thus more money keeps pouring in. As Ponzi used most of the money to buy expensive clothes, ate at the fanciest restaurants, and even went for luxurious vacations, those lifestyle changes did not last long. Less than six months after Ponzi launched his new venture, there were lots of doubts about his business. But since early investors had already been paid, which Ponzi said was proof everything was legitimate, people kept quiet. One day, Clarence Barron, the president of Dow Jones and manager of the Wall Street Journal, spotted the obvious scheme. Barron calculated that Ponzi would need to purchase 160 million IRCs for that kind of profit return. But there are only 27,000 in circulation in the whole world. So, in July of 1920, Barron started to investigate into Ponzi's company. Unlike Ponzi, a newly hired publicist at Ponzi's company, William McMasters, is an honest man and found out his client was a fraud. With access to Ponzi's records, McMasters collected the evidence he needed and went to the Boston Post, where he wrote a Pulitzer Prize-winning expose detailing all of Ponzi's secrets. Ponzi's scheme soon collapsed alongside with several banks, decimating 15,000 people's life savings that was worth $20 million in 1920, which is approximately $297 million in 2022. Ponzi himself was indicted on 86 counts of mail fraud. However, the con man cleverly was able to strike a deal in court and only ended up serving five years in jail. He was released from prison on parole after three and a half years and finally decided to do some good for the world. Nah, I'm just kidding. He went on scamming with another of his new schemes and was being pursued by the authorities. Ponzi fled from Boston to Florida, where he planned to essentially repeat the Ponzi scam again. He started a new company called Sharpon Land Syndicate, which involves looking for people to invest into the property sector around Jacksonville, and offered people ridiculous gains of 200% in just 60 days. However, there were no takers for this time around as the properties were just swamplands. When Ponzi's fraud was exposed once again, he changed his appearance and attempted to travel back to his country Italy as a sailor on board a cargo ship. However, he was recognized and arrested for the fourth time in New Orleans. Ponzi was desperate and wrote a letter to President Calvin Coolidge, the 30th President of the United States, asking for mercy and even appealed to the Prime Minister of Italy, Benito Mussolini, to intervene on his behalf. But of course, no one gives a shit, and he ended up spending another seven years in prison. After seven long years, he was never the same again. By that time, Ponzi was 52 years old. Ponzi was a broken mess who had lost all the charm and confidence that he once had. As he faced deportation to Italy, his wife chose to stay behind in America and divorced him three years later in 1937. However, when it comes to the amount of money Ponzi conned out of people, he's actually not one of the biggest financial fraudsters, because that crown goes to Bernie Madoff in the year 2008. If you want to know how Madoff managed to pull off one of the biggest financial scams ever, you can check out our video in the description down below. Charles Ponzi, the infamous fraudster who spent a total of 15 years in prison throughout his lifetime, spent the rest of his years in poverty, with only memories of the times when he had it all to comfort him. 
He ended up in Rio de Janeiro, where he died in 1949 at the age of 66, in a charity hospital and was buried in a pauper's grave. Thus, bringing an end to the story of Charles Ponzi and one of the most notorious financial frauds in history.